Although I've discovered with our team, they're all so young, they hardly know who Chuck Norris was. So I'm guessing most of you who are watching are, uh, are aware of Chucky Baby. You know, Chuck, I actually went out and looked. I'm like, how old is Chuck? He's 80 years young. That's pretty amazing, Zach. Did you know that? <laughs> no, I didn't know. I didn't know he was that. Uh, I didn't know he was that young. No. <laughs> Well, Chuck is uh, is so tough. He drinks uh, the coronavirus for, for lunch. So, um, welcome everybody. It's good to see you again. We're uh, we're really enjoying having a little bit of fun around the office. Actually, just to give you kind of a quick update, yesterday, Monday, a day that will last in infamy in our office, uh, we returned from our exile, our self-imposed exile, and um, we actually are now kind of in a hybrid mode. We're uh, we we've We've learned a lot actually operating remotely as an entire team, and so we're we're going to continue to take what we've learned and, and try to take uh, bits and pieces of that and, and and continually try to improve our our client experience. And so um, Zach and I right now are, are of course obviously still logging into this call from remote, but uh, the rest of our team is back in the office, and um, we decided that uh, we would take this a step at a time and. You're certainly welcome to come by, but we're not scheduling any client meetings yet in the office. Um, one thing I was going to mention uh, as we get rolling here today on our topic, Zach, is that I guess we didn't realize it at the time, but for, for the last couple of years, we've been we've been doing virtual meetings. Um, you know, so many of our clients live in Houston, and and uh, because of that's where we got our start uh, years ago. But I guess that was part of the reason. But to us, this feels very natural, uh, and we're actually, we've brought several new clients on during this past uh, six weeks. Um, so, you know, I, we were talking about this in one of our team huddles the other day. Uh, for those of you on the call, if, if you have uh, friends who, who don't have a team like us, who doesn't have, don't have somebody like us that's helping them, um, I think there's a lot of people out there that are thinking, man, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to somebody when this whole thing settles down, but honestly, they don't have to wait. And, and so if, if you know somebody who you think could really uh, benefit from talking to us, put, a, put them over to us and, and we, we're, we're operating it, to us. It feels very normal. Um, so, but we're also really enjoying this, this weekly opportunity to kind of just invite our clients into a, a discussion. Uh, each week, we've we've done something a little differently. This week, we thought we would we would dig into a, a, a topic that was in the headlines here, Zach, in the last week and a half. Obviously, uh, in Texas, oil is a big part of our our economic reality here. It has been my whole life, um, and these the prices of oil falling like they did is is just uh, stunning. Honestly, I, I remember back in the '80s. Um, you know, pretty much the entire economy in Texas was built around real estate and oil. And uh, today, thankfully, we have a much broader and more diversified economy. But still, nobody can deny that when prices are falling to this level, uh, you know, it, it really is a, a challenge for many of our businesses. And we've we've heard from a couple of clients that are starting to feel the the impact of that at their employers. But today, I, th I think we wanted to kind of dig in a little bit and use this as an example of, um, you know, how, how, we, how should we view this kind of an event when it happens in real time? If we're going to approach managing money wisely, how do we take this kind of information in? And, and it's obviously our instinct is, gosh, you know, I know oil is not going to stay at zero. It's going to recover. Man, should I buy on the dip? And what would that look like, right? And, and I know we've, we've had that happen before with whether it was digital currencies or, you know, more recently, the, the travel industry has been decimated. And so folks, understandably, they're wondering, you know, what, is there an opportunity there? Um, so the answer is, yeah, there could be opportunities there. But the bigger question is, what's, what's the wise way to go about taking advantage of these opportunities and how should they find their way into what I'm doing, right? So yeah. we thought we would keep the discussion just between us. Um, all of you on the call probably know Zach well. Uh, Zach has been now part of our team for approaching 10 years. What you may not know is that coming right out of school, Zach was, he really kind of thought he was going to be a portfolio analyst and, and was really passionate about investing in portfolio analysis. He got a chance to do some hands-on work in college, uh, managing some real funds uh, at the college. And 
Um, so this has always been a, a high level of interest for you, Zach, and, and, uh, and you've got a lot of knowledge and ability in this area. So I thought it would be a great thing for you to kind of walk us through um, a little bit more of uh, getting into the weeds on this whole thing about oil. So I'll turn it over to you and I may ask you a question or two, but just walk us through some, some of your, your thoughts on this and how it relates to our clients uh, when it comes to these crazy oil price swings we've seen. Yeah, it's, um, it's been uh, here in a second. I've got a couple slides that we'll look at, but you're exactly right. We've what really prompted this discussion was uh, talking with a lot of you, our clients, over the last couple months. Uh, some of you tuning in today are uh, have had lifelong careers in the oil and gas industry. Um, some of you inherited royalties from from uh, your your parents or grandparents. Um, and then, of course, you know, being here in Texas, like Bob said, um, or even, you know, the country in the last decade has changed a lot when it comes to oil and gas. Um, you know, if you're in Wyoming or North Dakota or uh, West Texas, there's just a lot of areas of the country that have just really been benefited in the last decade from from an oil boom. Um, and so we're all we're all connected to it in one way, especially here in the state of Texas. But uh I've had some conversations with many of you over the last couple of months about saying, hey, uh, you know, I was watching the news. I saw oil. It's just it's tanking. We, I want to buy it. And, um, you know, many different conversations, but wanted to talk about it today because uh, some, some people see it as a long term buy. There's some people that say, hey, I want to jump right in and make a quick buck. And so there's a there's. Uh, prudent ways to invest and then there's ways that can really put you in the position where um, you're taking a lot of risk and it, and it may not work very well so um, before we talk more about that maybe how it should affect you or what if should it change anything that you're doing I just kind of wanted to take some time today to talk about uh, the market itself what's been going on in the, in the oil market what's what's uh, causing the changes that are there to happen um, so we're just going to keep it high level today and not get really down in the weeds with a lot of the technical stuff. Um, as Bob said, I did, I did have a background doing analysis, but uh, I figured out eventually after I got out of school that I like talking with you guys a lot more than I like looking at, at uh, balance sheets and profit and loss statements. So um, I've been out of that realm uh, for a while, but I do enjoy still dabbling and it still interests me and, and, and just my curiosity leads me to kind of take a close look at things. So we'll, uh, with hey, that, Zach, let's jump in. I'm going to- Zach, go ahead, go ahead and, and share your screen. But while you're doing that, I, I want to kind of bring this down to a, a really a, a practical level uh, at right, right as you get going here. Um, and, and today, uh, we're, we're not going to mention specific companies or anything, guys. It, it gets complicated with compliance issues and whatnot. But, but <laughs> I just want you to understand what the, the kind of calls that, that we, we get from you guys and, and we love you guys and we want to help you. Um, and and it's, we understand why we get these calls, but um, you, there's, there are household names that we would all know if I said them uh, in the oil and gas business and maybe their share prices have traded for over a hundred dollars a share in, in recent years, Zach, you know, which company I have in mind. We talked, mm -hmm. we've talked about this. Um, and, and, and so the, the price drops and hovers around $75 or $80 a share for a couple of years. And you're thinking, well, okay, it's not really doing anything. And then all of a sudden, the price drops to 60 And you're thinking, oh, man, that's a heck of a deal. It's got a 5% dividend yield now. You know, it used to be three. <laughs> I'm buying. And, and you buy at 60 And then in three months, it goes from 60 to 30 and And you're like, this can't really? You know, but but yeah, it really it, it can happen. We, we've watched it happen. So, you know, we, this is where we can sometimes be our own worst enemies as we get caught up either in the you know, there's two ends of this right on the emotional spectrum. There's the fear and, and we we make emotional decisions based on fear or the other side of it is, you know, greed. And, and we're like, hey, you know, this can't go down any further. Well, yeah, it can. So you, you just got to always be careful uh, when you try to make these these bets on a particular company or a particular sector. You got to really be careful. And, and um, 
So again, that's the spirit uh, that we're coming to this discussion with today. Uh, we've really seen this happen to real people. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there to kind of make it a little more practical and real as you're wading into this. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. So uh, hopefully you guys can see the screen here. Just a, a just got a few slides um, that we're going to look at today here. Um, oil, like most commodities, just like corn or wheat or, or you know any other any other commodity out there, the price of it really comes down to supply and demand. And with oil, it's somewhat seasonal. Uh, many of you probably do a lot more traveling in the summer than you do uh, in the winter, and so there tends to be a rise in the a slight rise in the price of oil during the, the summer months, just because it's consumed a little bit more. Um, but at its most basic level, the price is just determined by the supply and demand. And that's really what the changes in those two things is really what is creating the huge price swing that we have seen lately. Um, so it all actually started kind of on a, something that didn't have anything to do with the virus. That's something that I've had, I've talked about a little bit the last couple months is the initial shock to the, to the oil market um wasn't actually the virus it was a meeting that happened on march 6 between russia and uh, opec which opec is basically a group of middle eastern oil producing countries and what they do is they kind of act like a cartel to where they are uh, decreasing supply and increasing the supply of oil across the world based on what they feel like is in their own best interest well there was a disagreement between Russia and, and Saudi Arabia, basically, and they, they, uh, Russia said, okay, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reduce the oil that we're selling. And Saudi said, well, if you're not gonna reduce your supply, then we're, we're just gonna turn our, our spigots on full blast. And so, um, basically the next, the next business day, the price of oil just started dropping because Saudi Arabia and Russia just full, turned their oil spigots on full blast. So that made a huge increase in the supply. That was really the first big massive change. Um, and then of course, we were just starting here in the US in early March, starting to really get into uh, the virus situation and people were, the stay at home orders were starting to, to come online. And so we had this, this twin scenario where uh, the supply, because of the Saudi-Russia disagreement, made the supply go through the roof, and then uh, the demand for, for oil or gas really um, started just dropping. And so supply was going up at the same time demand was going down and cratering. So weak demand, oversupply, what that does is it just creates a situation where the price goes down. And then to couple that uh, uh, with those two things was this other scenario where um, the world has moments where we have more oil than we need and we have huge massive resources to store billions and billions of barrels of oil and we've kind of been nudging up towards the maximum storage capacity for a while and then this happened and it's like oh no what are we going to do in the next couple months we're gonna run out of space to store all this oil. And the thing about oil, whether it's here in Texas or Saudi Arabia or Russia, it's very hard to just overnight turn off those spigots and to just cut the supply. Um, and so we started to approach the, the point to where we're not having any storage that's left. And there's not, we're, we're too slow to cut back on how fast we're taking it out of the ground. So. In the last couple of months, there's been oil tankers uh, just sitting in the Gulf and around the world uh, off of off the coast that are basically just acting as storage oil facilities at this point. So that's really the situation that's kind of cropped up in the last couple of months that's made the, the price just drop dramatically. And then number five on this slide, you can see the uh, the uh, it mentions um, an ETF that that basically uh, a lot of people assumed that it was just tracking the price of oil there's a little bit more to that and so we'll kind of kind of briefly touch on that here in a bit but let's uh let's go to the next slide just kind of take a look at the inventory situation 
So here I mentioned that, you know, we're running out of places to store it. This chart shows the white line is how many barrels we had in storage tanks uh, in 2017. The blue line's 2018. 2019, you can see that's the red line. It starts to go up. And then that purple line is so far in 2020. So, I mean, it's not a huge change, but when we're already near the max storage capacity, and it's not like, you know, these, these tanks that hold storage, uh, oil storage, they take months to build. They're huge, huge tanks. And I mean, when you drive on I-10 between uh, Houston and San Antonio, you can see these, you, you go by these tanks at certain points, but um, you just can't create storage overnight. And so when people start to see that purple line going up, they're saying, okay, um, what are we going to do with all this oil? It's coming out of the ground. If we get to the point, and this was the expectation about a month ago, if we get to the point where there's literally no storage left, then there's a situation that could arise where people are actually having to pay people to take oil from them because they have nowhere to put it. Um, and so there was some discussion about negative oil prices and that's where that would kind of come from. So we're really dealing with a kind of an unprecedented situation here. You know, in the seventies, there was this huge oil shortage. Now there's this, this glut. And so many of you have experienced uh, both sides of this. So um, you can see here uh, the bullet points over on the right, OPEC, that's basically Saudi Arabia and the other Middle Eastern countries. Um, they talked about cutting 10 million barrels a day of production. Um, that sounds like a lot, but, but the demand has decreased to where we're only needing less than 30 million what we previously were. So there's not really um, a way for them to kind of turn things off quick enough. Um, so that, that, this is the, the inventory situation that really is, is uh, giving rise to the, the massive price drop that we're seeing in oil. Um, so Zach, would, yeah. your, I mean, the obvious conclusion from all of this is that really the only, they, they can cut back on production a little bit, but from my days at, at an uh, oil company right out of college, I, re I remember uh, you, you can't, it's not as easy to turn off a well as people might think. You can't just shut mm -hmm. it down without implications. And so I guess really the only solution to this is, is we've got to get the, get the economy uh, to, on the demand side, you know, going again. And of course, there's a lot of reasons why that needs to happen, but this is just another one of those reasons. Um, yeah. So, so otherwise we're going to have this choking off of, of uh, the producers being able to even pump the stuff out of the ground. And that's going to lead to some structural issues uh, longer term, I think. Yeah, there's, there's definitely potential for that. Um, so some of you may be looking at what, what we've been talking about and saying, okay, well, they might be slow to, to cut things off, but what if I buy oil today and hold it and just wait for the demand to come back and the, and the, and the supply to go down, right? They'll, there's, just to, just to give you an idea of how even in the U.S. we're cutting back here, um, eventually you, you get to a point uh, to where um, the price of oil drops down long enough, uh, far enough to where it's not efficient to take it out of the ground. So here in the U.S., once the price of oil goes under $30 a barrel, um, it's not profitable to, to take it out anymore. So that's basically the... the uh, the cost of producing the oil here in the U.S. So, um, you know, recently oil has been down in the low 20 range, down in the high teens. There was even a point whenever um, oil on, in the futures market was was down into you know $12 a barrel. So, at a lot of the oil and gas companies are looking at that here in the U.S. and saying, okay, we're not starting any new projects. We're going to start winding down our current operations. That's been happening. Um, was reading the other day, just in North Dakota alone, um, the oil production in the last couple months is two thirds of what it was two months ago. So they've basically cut their oil production uh, by one third in the last couple months. And so we're seeing that here in Texas, we're seeing that up in, in uh, Wyoming and other the large other large oil producing parts of the U.S. Um, so some of you may be thinking, and, and I've had some conversations with you guys in the last couple months, hey, 
I'm going to go buy oil when it's on sale and, and, and it will just wait um, until the price goes back up and then I'll sell that. And, and there is some potential opportunity for that, but how you do that is very important. Um, as Bob mentioned, you could go buy a, an oil company stock that you've heard of, the big names. Um, there's a lot of potential risk in that. You could also buy um, just an ETF that was basically a, a essentially a basket uh, of, of uh, it's not a basket of the oil companies, but this this ETF right here, it's a fund, USO. If you, most people think that it's, it represents the price of oil today. And that's not entirely true. It actually, um, when, when people start buying these uh, funds like this, there's a lot more going on underneath or behind the scenes than a lot of people realize. Um, there's really two prices of oil. And so you can think if you owned an airline company and you knew your, you had to buy jet fuel, you could buy jet fuel just today as you needed it. Uh, or you could buy, you could say, hey, in a couple months, we're gonna need jet fuel. I'm gonna, today, I'm gonna go buy the jet fuel I need two months from now. And so when you do that, you're buying uh, the futures basically on, on that jet fuel. And the same thing happens in the oil market. So um, there's the price of oil today, and then there's the price of, of the futures contract that's there's one month, two months, three months out. So, you, so there's people out there that are buying um, oil in the future as, as they think that they'll need it. And so when, when you start buying a fund like this, you're not just buying the price of oil today, you're actually buying uh, what you're buying represents some of those future contracts contracts and uh what that can do is that it can create a big disparity between the price of oil and what the price of something like this fund is doing that people think is the price of oil so um really one of the things the reason that i'm mentioning mentioning this today to you guys is because um it's really easy for us to to, uh, as Bob mentioned, either be a, appealed to on the, maybe on the greed side, there's fear and then there's greed when it comes to investing. And some of us are saying, man, this is so cheap, I gotta go get it. Um, it can be sometimes easy to buy something like this and, and not fully understand it. So, and even when you buy it, as, as is the case with this USO, what they did is the oil market, when it started moving around so much, it, it things started swinging in such huge directions that they actually changed what this fund represents. So it used to represent that the third bullet point there, it previously represented a mix of the next month's future price of oil and, and the second month out. And it used to be an 80, 20 mix. Well, they changed that and they actually moved it to where it, it represented oil price farther in the future. And the reason that they did that is because um, the price of oil got so volatile and was moving around so much in the, in the short time, in the short period that the, the fund really couldn't keep up with it. And so oil was going up and the fund was going down or it would, they were moving in the same direction, but in completely different increments. So um, they really were just, they couldn't keep up with it. And so they changed that. And that's one of the huge risk when you buy into something like this this fund is it's it's really up to the managers of the fund to decide what that fund represents and so whether it whether we're talking about oil or we're talking about cruise ships or we're talking about airlines there's a lot of things right now uh, in the market that are cheap and we just uh, part part of the uh, job that Bob and I have is to try to um, discuss with you guys the risk of going in and buying those things because uh, we have a phrase that we use you may have you may have heard called "Don't try to catch a falling knife," and it's really uh, uh, relevant to this to this oil case is just because something's going down in price a lot don't don't just run and go buy it. Um, and so that's really, if there's one big takeaway from uh, this webinar that you leave with, um, we want that to be that um, 
there are always going to be opportunities in the market, even now in the midst of the, of the, uh, the big swings that we've been seeing. But it's important to uh, keep the long term in mind and to really let um, the experts at the end of the day uh, decide what is the best thing to buy and sell. And when I say experts, I'm not even talking about Bob and myself. So we, uh, most of you are invested in strategies that are investment committee. Um, it's a team of people and all they do every day is research what to buy and sell and hold. So they are looking at everything in our portfolio strategies, what we own, monitoring it for risk. And they're not talking, uh, spending any time talking with you guys. They're not doing any webinars uh, for you guys. And so they're really free to fully spend 100% of their time focusing on um, these investments and being privy to what these securities actually represent. So um, we just want you guys to know that there are opportunities out there. We have a new opportunity fund, which we've talked with you, a few of you about. Um, some of you guys have, have moved some of your, uh, your current investments into that. And that's a good way to take advantage of some of the opportunities in the market right now that exist out there, but, but to, not, um, to not just go away what may be in the news at the time or what's getting the most hype. Um, so Bob, yes, I don't know if you have any any anything well, more. To yeah, say. no, I no, that's perfect, and I, I think you know you did a great job walking through this, and and Zach has basically given you a, a very short uh, uh, list of information here that that was pulled from a a more detailed discussion that we got from one of our investment team members um, uh, back when this was happening in real time about a week week and a half ago, um, and that is we think one of the huge values that. Our, our, um, our partnership with Carson Group brings to our clients is, you know, Zach and I are very busy uh, doing all the things that we think uh, bring value to the work we do with you from a planning aspect and from making sure that we understand where you're at in your life and in your particular situation. Um, and so many financial advisor offices, uh, I know because uh, I, I was this office for a lot of years, uh, and I, I've met hundreds of advisors over the years um, and they're great people with the best of intentions. But the problem is they're trying to do something that's very difficult, if not impossible. And that's be great at everything. You, you can't be great at everything. There's a, a, the, the more complex things get, Zach, in the, in the realm of financial uh, decision making and, and particularly in the area of investing and whatnot, no, no one or two people can be you know, really great at, at all the demands of that. So you have to find ways to leverage expertise uh, in, 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 you know, the, you, the, the sum of the parts is greater uh, is that than, than any individual piece is added up separately. So, um, you know, the investment part of this is a huge value, I think, for our clients because of that. It's, um, we've got incredibly uh, effective strategies but each one of them is unique and disciplined and defined to do different things. And, and so our job is to understand those strategies, understand our client, and then blend the strategies together so we do the best job we can possibly do of dialing in the amount of risk for the plan for that client, right? And that, that gives you a good shot of getting the returns your plan needs, but also gives you a risk level you can tolerate we don't like it ever when our accounts are down, but it happens, right? The question is, when does the pain get so bad that we just, we, we can't stand it and we, and we make a, a decision that might be bad for us later on. Um, and so when we get into the weeds of looking at things like, you know, oil price fluctuation, um, all of it eventually percolates up into, in our, in our approach, it percolates up into some of these strategies. And so clients can have access uh, and, and take advantage of these opportunities, but it's not based on a hot tip from, you know, from our neighbor uh, or the, we always hear the great stories, Zach, right? We always hear the wins. Yeah. We never hear about when I bought at 60 and it went to 30 and I lost half my money in three months. Nobody ever wants to tell that story out at the cocktail party or at the barbecue. You know, they tell you about the time they got it right. And that's great. Um, it's just really hard to you know, bet your future on that type of thing. So Hopefully this gives you guys some uh, something to think about and, and some perspective on the oil prices. Uh, Zach, thanks for walking us through that. And 
we want to keep these to 30 minutes each week. So we're going to wrap this up. I will just say that um, if you have questions about this or anything else going on, uh, we can't really take them live on these discussions for compliance reasons, but just email us and you know we'll be right back to you. Also, I want to ask you a one question poll <laughs> if any of you want to chime in on this. Um, do you listen to podcasts? And uh, if actually it's a one and a half question poll. Do you listen to podcasts? And if so, where do you, where do you, where do you access them? Um, we're thinking coming out of uh, the Corona experience that we may keep doing this Wise Council Live weekly, but we may transition it into a podcast format. And we'd like to know if there's any interest or application for you out there. Uh, next week, we've got um, a local attorney, estate planning attorney, Brad Wewell. He's going to be talking to us about a very practical thing. Um, uh, you know, what, what, what happens when you die without a will? Um, and, you know, we'll get into some other practical uh, aspects of, of documents today that it, it's been interesting, Zach. We've had a lot more interest from clients when we're talking to them about, about their estate planning documents and updating them. And I guess the, the reason is fairly obvious. Um, but it's always important to have that part of your life in good order. So Brad's going to be on next week as our guest, and we'll be talking about that with him. Otherwise, uh, that's about it. Zach, you got anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? Uh, not really. I just will, regarding next week, our conversation, uh, I, I got married about a year ago, many of you know, and redid my will and all my documents, state documents and, and the healthcare documents. And I can say that in the last couple months, even though I've done mine basically in the last year, in the last couple months, there's been some things that I realized about, you know, it said exactly what I wanted, but there's some changes that if, if I, if with, with the virus and what has happened, there's some changes that I would make to that. And so I'm going to be looking at doing that. So even if you, even if you've done your estate documents and healthcare documents soon, uh, I just encourage you to chime in next week and, uh, We'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah, we're going to we're going to bring some some aspects to that discussion that that aren't aren't very uh, they're, they're not they're not that well known, uh, even in the advisor community, much less uh, your, your average person out there living their life and raising their family and doing their doing their thing. All right. Well, um, if you uh, you guys know, I guess we've said this, this is really designed to be a place for clients to come and hang out with us each week. But uh, we're not going to. Uh, mind if you decide to share the link next week and invite somebody over that you think might benefit and enjoy the discussion. So feel free to do that. But we're not promoting this uh, outside of our client list. And uh, we just wanted to have a time each week to come together and talk with you guys and, um, and have some FaceTime with you uh, in these interesting times we're living in. So thank you for being here. And we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Have a great day. Bye-bye.